It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, George Elliott Clark here tonight. He was born in, in Windsor, Nova Scotia, near the Black Loyalist community of Three Mile Plains. He's a graduate of the University of Waterloo, Dalhousie, and Queens, where he attained his PhD in 1993. He's currently the E.J. Pratt Professor of Canadian Literature at the University of Toronto, taught in various capacities at Duke, McGill, Mount Allison, and Harvard. He's worked as a researcher, editor, social worker, parliamentary aide, newspaper columnist. Uh, a very short, um, uh, condensed um, look at awards and honours. Uh, George Elliott Clark has won the Governor General's Award for Poetry, the National Magazine Gold Medal for Poetry, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Achievement Award, the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellowship Prize, and has been appointed to the Order of Nova Scotia and to the Order of Canada at the rank of officer. He has eight honorary doctorates. George Elliott Clark's energetic contributions to Canadian literature and culture are tremendously varied, expansive, and prolific. A revered poet, playwright, and novelist, he's also an inspired and inspiring critic whose Odyssey's Home, Mapping African Canadian Literature, and uh, Directions Home, Approaches to African Canadian Literature, along with many, many essays, form an indispensable, celebrated, and much appreciated body of criticism. <coughs> It's important to note that George Eliot Clark's creative work does not remain static. Uh, While of Falls, for example, a rogue collection of poems, uh, and that, those are George's words, uh, Portrait of a Community was adopted by uh, George Eliot Clark for radio and stage, and this type of adaptation or adaptation is the norm rather than the exception. He writes opera libretto and jazz libretto, the energy and creativity are overwhelming. Africadia, the complex geographical, cultural, historical, environmental home region of George Elliott Clark in Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada is named by him and is powerfully and evocatively conveyed in his creative work of many genres and layers. More recently, as the Poet Laureate of Toronto from 2012 to 15, uh, George Elliott Clark collaborated with the Toronto Public Library to create the Toronto Poetry Map. And I recommend that you Google it for a surprising journey through Toronto's literary sites. Um, so Africadia and Toronto. George Elliott Clark always takes us on amazing and moving journeys. Tonight's topic is, as ever, enticing. Uh, his title, Black Ice and Yellow Snow on Digging into Canuck Pulp Fiction. And he tells us he's going to survey classic and recent examples of works that may be considered Canadian versions of Pulp Fiction or popular reader-oriented texts exploiting sex and or violence to determine whether there are any specifically Canadian hallmarks or aesthetics related to the bastard texts of the Canlet canon. Please join me in welcoming George Elliott Clark to tonight's lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much. That's a wonderful introduction, Professor, St Professor Steffler. And I also want to thank Professor Dunnett for having invited me. I want to thank all of you for being interested. I want to thank Janine Crow uh, for organizing uh, my visit. Here, uh, I want to thank uh, someone, uh, perhaps Ms. Crow again, and, and others for the beautiful poster. It's a great poster, I think so anyway, and I hope I can have a copy to take home with me uh, later. Uh, so that would be very, very nice. Uh, thank you for your interest in this. I almost forgot, uh, this is, um, I'm still Poet Laureate of Toronto for four more days. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being happily replaced by Ann Michaels, effective December 1st. So this is one of the last times I can, I can wear this medal in public. So in fact, it probably is the last time I can wear it in public. So there it is. Um, introducing the 2007 New York Review of Books Classics edition of John Glasgow's Memoirs of Montparnasse from 1970, the American novelist Louis Bagley has Glasgow or Buffy looking back on his work in 1969, 30 years after the story ended, and feeling obliged to admit that Buffy is less like someone I have been than a character in a novel. Though Bagley is short by a decade in terms of Buffy's retrospective account of late 1920s, Montparnasse and Montmartre, his quotation from Glasgow resonates nicely with the heroic narrator's opinion in A Woman in Berlin from 1954 that as a witness to and victim of the Soviet Red Army's rapacious occupation of Berlin in May 1945, 
that she's been living, she says, within numerous pulp novels. She too, in her diary, chronicling the dozen and a half rapes that she endured from seven Soviet soldiers, feels as if she is a literary character. No wonder then that following her terminal bidding by a Russian major, for whom she has come to feel a quantum of affection, anonymous drafts, and erotic passage in square brackets, wherein she writes, weeks later, scribbled in the margins to be used by novelists, for three heartbeats, her body became one with the unfamiliar body on top of her. Her nails dug into the stranger's hair. She heard the cries coming from her own throat and the stranger's voice whispering words she couldn't understand. Fifteen minutes later, she was all alone. The crucial point of this quotation is that the brute experience of rape, as previously detailed in the memoir, has now become a romantic, erotic passage to be used by novelists. In the case of the German diarist Anonymous and the Canadian bon vivant and self-described pornographer John Buffy Glasgow, 1909 to 81, personal experience moves from objective journalism, literally, to the casting of scenes with literary aspiration. And these scenes might also be classed as blue, as in porn, or noir, as in crime depictions, thus tipping the writing into the precincts of pulp fiction, and I should add quickly, nonfiction. See, for instance, Glasgow's recollection of his employee as a gigolo available for any uh, uh, older lady. He says, when I caressed her, there was the same cold, selfish, remote look on her face. These were attentions she could enjoy by herself. For her, it was the triumph of egotism, a kind of effortless masturbation. Naturally, then, the memoir, if at all truthful, slides freely into the lyric and the kernel, providing the same frisson of violation and thrills of violence that one expects to find in generic erotica or suspense works, even those that appear on Canadian bookshelves. And I should be clear here that despite my title, I do understand the that the adjective pulp may preface nonfiction as well as fiction. So not only the detective story can be pulp, but so can the work of true crime merit the same adjective. Indeed, I view pulp as a synonym and pseudo-homonym for popular. But what is pulp? No less an authority than Marshall McLuhan recognizes that post-war advertising that jazzily ensnares the Hemingway hero in the swells and contractions of the violent stimuli which his big, noisy, kinesthetic environment has provided for his unreflective reception is at the base of the sex appeal of pulp. McLuhan also posits that the theme of, de of detective fiction, or noir, is violent death and human gore, which contrasts with the colorless lives of its readers. In terms of sexual stimulus, thinks McLuhan, the pulp technique seeks to see something important, a man or a thought, destroyed in order to deliver the supreme, visceral wallet. According to Peter Haining, the pulp magazines of the early to mid 20th century were all about three things action, adventure, and sex, not necessarily together or in that order. And generally, these were fellow-centric, gaudy, sensation-packed fiction titles and bluntly provocative with lurid front cover illustrations of gory encounters and terrified maidens exploiting unashamed gaudiness. Haining also claims that pulp works were prescribed by parents, condemned by educators, and ignored by critics. Yet, intriguingly, this literature of suspense, surprise, and sensation is the sin qua non of the modern. Haining points out that the pulp magazines were the medium through which some excellent and sometimes experimental writing was published. When paperback books emerged in the early 20th century, the pioneering American publisher Pocket Books hired illustrators to adorn its paperbacks with colorful, eye-catching graphics, many of them similar to their pulp magazine brethren. And that's from Stephen Brower. From this time forward, says Brower, the paperback format and brash illustrations would be linked under the catch-all phrase, Pulp Fiction. So, uh, and I, and I, and I want to uh, 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 try uh, this uh, PowerPoint uh, situation. Yes, all right, here, here we are. So just to, you, know, you have to have some illustrations. So anyway, uh, uh, Gil Brewer, uh, girl from Hatefield, all right, so uh, typical. And of course, this is a, this is a, 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 a new number. Uh, look out, lock, lock up your daughter's Darcy's in town, of course. And I think you could do this with all kinds of classic works, you know. You can have lots of fun taking any kind of classic uh, canonical text and, and uh, rendering it with a nice, 
uh, lurid uh, uh, pulp uh, uh, illustration as a, for a cover. And another, another one, uh, Lady Boss, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Probably uh, adult reading, an original after hours book, so right. Uh, <laughs> con contemplate um, uh, working for such a boss. Uh, in any event, for his part, McLuhan locates the modern Edgar Allan Poe for he believed in presenting readers with a consideration of an effect. And in the technique of T.S. Eliot, uh, McLuhan says, each poem is slanted to a different effect. So that it's not something his poems say, but something they do that is essential about them. And, and I just want to throw this out. I think one way of understanding the, the wasteland is that it might be a version of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, in terms of looking at it, and, and could definitely uh, use a, a very lurid uh, cover. Uh, in, this regard, in this regard, McLuhan's view of James Joyce instructs us that a canonical creative writer may also indulge, of course, in popular culture, He's, as he says. To write his epic of the modern Ulysses, Joyce studied all his life the ads, the comics, the pulps, and popular speech. As just cited, McLuhan views Eliot's poetry as being steeped in effects as offering shocks of crime and jokes of coitus, and John Skates in his study, Crime Fiction, agrees. He views the wasteland as depicting the modern industrial city as a hell whose inhabitants have been undone by a kind of death that is not physical but spiritual and emotional. Skaggs also sees that Eliot's infernal London or unreal city parallels the unreality of Raymond Chandler's Los Angeles and Dashiell Hammett's San Francisco. Uh, so to continue on, as for Eliot, given his knowledge of Dante, Shakespeare, and thriller novels, there is an acknowledgment that the camp of the thrilling and the shocking, the grisly and the dirty, is ecumenical and cosmopolitan, with room for saints to slum and sinners to celebrate. However, this doesn't mean that there is automatic academic approval for works that aim to slap the face, poke the eye, knee the groin, turn the stomach, or excite adrenaline flow, or frig the genitals. First, there is the concern that sensation-laden works promote primitive, febrile sensuality over the civilizing machinery of reason. If so, then a credible response could be to withdraw from pondering the complexities of human behavior and from certain kinds of ethical claims worries John Fraser. And this response, if sustained, becomes dehumanizing, for one is always in danger of lapsing into indifference towards subjects that one cannot afford to be indifferent to. It can be too welcome a relief to escape from the pain of intellectually oriented consciousness. Secondly, there is the worry that the felt appeal to senses of mere sensations overturns the standards of critics, the aesthetics of schools, and the hierarchies of taste established and maintained with such missionary rigor by scholars here and clerics there, enlightened despots here and educated dilettantes there. Stephen Brower opines, despite the literary and artistic merit of the work contained within or lack, there, or lack thereof, Sorry, or lack there. The mass market paperbacks were forever branded as lurid, trashy, and kitsch. For his part, Jeffrey O'Brien chronicles his teen obsession with post war American paperbacks that flourished due to utter disregard for good taste and moral uplift. Their promise of some kind of nitty gritty in place of the glossy vistas offered by the more respectable echelons of mass culture was verified by their covers more voyeuristic than decorative and their shamelessly exploitative treatment of their subject matter, the poetry of ordinary streets and cheap hotels. Yet, as Robert Lesser argues, pulp art itself is the result of an attitude eminently American that he says, all are free to love this or hate that, to collect or reject whatever without a fine arts professor's permission or the wax seal of approval from the elite of a major metropolitan museum. Susan Sontag also recognizes the broad bailiwick in which campy works may fall. Her own random list includes Aubrey Beardsley drawings, the old Flash Gordon comics, the novels of Ivy Compton Burnett, and Stagg films seen without lust. Not only does Sontag allow for the possibility of considering comic books, porn, and underappreciated novels as constituting a form of, a form of art, so does she license generally the possibility that any creator can craft anything <coughs> or something considered art. Style is the principal decision in a work of art, the signature of the artist's will, and as the human will is capable of an infinite number of stances, there are an indefinite number of possible styles for works of art. In Lester's view, such cultural anarchy means any picture painted anywhere, anytime on the planet is art. Not fine or commercial art, not high art or low art, not populist art or museum, art, just art. 
Lesser's passion for the genre is born partly of his fervent cultural populism, which he traces to the American revolutionary rejection of a European small elite that once dictated the absolutes of culture, endorsing the high and repressing the low. But the success of the revolution meant that any American was free to sing any song, paint any picture, write any story, pay his money to see, hear, and buy what he liked without any prince or priest wedged in between. Enthusing, Lesser ignores episodes of cultural repression in America, from McCarthyism to the current war on terror. And his celebration of the democratic availability of the arts in America does highlight, however, the ways in which Canada, being still a monarchy, is somewhat less reticent to endorse popular culture and somewhat more likely to recognize elite culture, especially of the literary sort. However, there has always been a market for pulp pleasures in Canada, as Carolyn Strange and Tina Liu attest in their study, True Crime, True North, The Golden Age of Canadian Pulp Magazines. And I quote them, Prior to the 1940s, Canadians had read about homegrown criminals in a variety of formats, including local newspapers and scandal sheets, classier book collections such as Murders and Mysteries, and a genre of dime novels known as Northerns. Like Westerns with their stress on man-sized adventures, they were uniquely Canadian because they specialized in regional crimes, Canada's Arctic, and regional crime fighters, Mounties. And so time for more illustrations. All right, so this is a, actually from a, a Canadian uh, magazine from the 1940s, uh, The Torch Murder, uh, which I guess is exactly what's going on. Uh, <laughs> Factual detective, factual detective stories, <laughs> marvelous. And of course, Montreal. It has to be a citadel of pulp, and especially Cote de Neige. For it's, it's a ricochet book. So uh, you have to, this must be a sequel or, or something, since it's the ricochet. But anyway, uh, and, and one more Montreal cover, Montreal cover. Here we go. Uh, sugar puts on, <laughs> on Dorchester Street. Wow, and you got the cliche in the background. And it's another ricochet book. So, um, yeah, so I have to wonder what the original was. Maybe one is the, is the ricochet of the other, uh, since they're both set in Montreal. Anyway, Strange and Ludi pick Canadian pulp magazines as specializing in regional crime, especially the dust em ups and shoot em ups of the Northern Territories, or perhaps you might say the shadow of the noir under the Northern Lights. If so, we must not restrict ourselves to magazine glimpses of what French critics call polar, but expand our reading list to include, for instance, poetry. And by this measure, Robert W. Service's popular Yukon set poems, The Cremation of Sam McGee and The Shooting of Dan McGrew, both from his first book, Songs of a Sourdough, from 1907, constitute northerns or pulp poems if one likes. In the first eight lines of Cremation of Sam McGee set the right noir atmosphere, a bit of black ice chill among the shivering illumination of the northern night. So I quote, there are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge, I cremated Sam McGee. And you, know, you, and you want to go on, you want to read more, because it's, it's an incredible uh, introduction to, to this uh, story. Now, some scholars might argue that services poems do belong in the genre of pulp romance and crime, for they are hardly canonical, that is to say, typifying the heights of achievement in Canadian letters. However, if one is ecumenical rather than elitist, or more in the camp of McLuhan than in the Monastery of Fry, it is suddenly possible to list canonical poems such as E.J. Pratt's The Titanic from 1935 and his Brave Book and his Brethren from 1940 as examples of Northerns, but more as tragedies than as crime tales. The same argument could be posited for Pratt's showpiece modern poem, The Convict Holocaust, in the groundbreaking anthology New Provinces, 1936, and certainly the depiction of the martyrdom of Braidoff, Braidoff could sit nicely within a pop crime tale. So I quote from Pratt, where was the source of his strength, the home of his courage that taught the best of their braves, and even outfabled the lore of their legends? Was it the blood? They would draw it fresh from its fountain. Was it the heart? They dug for it, fought for the scraps and the way of the wolves. Similarly, the randomly iceberg-stabbed Titanic is a version of Polar, 
as is Pratt's rendition of convicts incinerated in a 1930 Columbus, Ohio prison fire. And I quote Pratt again, 300 pariahs ranged side by side upon the floors along the cattle stalls. The fires consumed their numbers with their breath, charred out their names, though many of the dead gave proof of valor just before their death that Caesar's legions might have coveted. Strange and Lou also maintain a 20th century Canadian pulp magazine's combined factual detail gleaned from court reports and police files with romantic depictions of ruthless killers and manly lawmen. Once again, one need only exercise a bit of imaginative categorization to picture Pratt's ship-slaying iceberg as a ruthless killer and his martyred French Catholic priests as types of manly lawmen. Strange and Lou also assert while stories of Canada's far north remained a staple, readers could also tuck into stories about murderers captured by Vancouver detectives or Montreal cops. From the Arctic to big city alleyways, they say Canadian pulps covered the national crime beat and did it with pizzazz. Crucially, as Strange and Lou confirm, a mixture of sexiness and moralism was a staple of true crime. Still, uh, Strange and Lou note authors' fixations on seedy hotel rooms, lonely farmhouses, and dark winter streets, as well as the use of covers printed in bright reds, yellows, and blues contrasted by deep shadows and swatches of black, all so as to scream sexually charged mayhem. In either case, Canuck or Yankee, the consumer of pulp fictions, enters a terrain defined by Sod, not by Disney, by Hitchcock, not by Busby Berkeley. Still, it is vital to register, as does O'Brien in the U.S. circumstance, that the pulp paperbacks were a stew of high and low, vigorous and decayed. So south of the border, a publisher, a publisher could bring out a porn pot boiler and a savvy work of critically praised literature, or Lust Party, right alongside Faulkner's Light in August. O'Brien canvasses one of the original American paperback publisher's pocket books to note its astonishing assortment of items, the Rubaya of Omer Khayyam, side by side with Hugger Mugger in the Louvre. Uh, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice, and the pocketbook of dog stories. To turn specifically to the Canadian context, although I, I think quickly that Darcy could be, uh, 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 or Wickham especially, could be considered a kind of a dog. Uh, so, you know, they, they sort of fit together. Uh, to turn specifically to the Canadian context in the mid-1960s, I believe a similar pattern of texts indiscriminately mingled and made it, to use O'Brien's phrase, emerged as well, so that Leonard Cohen's canonical, scatological, and anti-clerical novel, Beautiful Losers, from 65, could emerge and share bookshelf space with Stephen Bezintzis, and excuse me, I'm, I have to practice pronouncing his name, I'm not gonna get it right, uh, excuse me, Stephen Bezintzis, not yet canonical in Canada novel, in praise of older women, the amorous recollections of Andres Vajda, also from 1965, however, while O'Brien locates in the U.S. a laissez-faire publishing and critical apparatus so that it is useless to distinguish among high art, personal art, folk art, commercial art, or exploitation, English Canada is, as usual, a different situation where the spicy text is not as respectable as the socially conscious text. Here it is easier to laud RT works, such as Cohen's, than erotic works, such as uh, that of Vicinci and or Glasgow. Uh, the late great post-colonial literary scholar John P. Matthews cites an inherited British-oriented elitism in English-Canadian literature, finding that we prefer academic to popular texts. Focusing on poetry, he writes, academic poetry refers to that based directly upon sophisticated models of the central British tradition, whether the theory and practice of such poetry had university associations or not. Contrarily, he says, Popular poetry refers to that of folk literature and to literary adapt adaptations of it based upon less sophisticated models of the central tradition. For Matthews, this means that the bias among English Canadian poets and critics is for a cerebral poetry, intellectual in conception. So Matthews' insight can be extended, I believe, to fiction as well. So in poetry, Anne Carson obtains greater respect than, say, Bill Bissett, while in fiction, Alice Munro obtains greater respect than Mavis Galant. Yet, as I hope to show, the division between ivory tower, ivy, and gutter trash is not as drastic as it appears at first glance. Uh, to take up Glasgow again, I have to note that his biographer, Brian Busby, laments, this country, Canada, has not treated Glasgow well. 
Busby backs up the statement telling us the 2001 Golden Dog edition of the English Governess is the only edition of Glasgow's international bestseller to have been published in his native land. Busby also says the Canadian reaction to Glasgow's pornography has been typically one of ignorance, indignation, and silence. So time for some images related to Glasgow. So yes, this is one of his, one of his uh, best works. Uh, uh, the English Governess, is, uh, of course, is one title for it. Uh, that's a more recent cover. This is, looks like a 1960s edition, Harriet Marwood Governess. It's the same story, uh, just different covers and slightly different title. Uh, anyway, uh, and originally written anonymously. And of course, Memoirs of, Ma of Montparnasse, and that's, of course, the images of Kiki, uh, who, of course, a uh, very famous uh, model uh, in, in the 1920s in Paris and an influence for many, many artists and writers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and of course, there is uh, Glasgow himself. Um, but anyway, in any event, Busby establishes the Canadian disregard for Glasgow extends to even his best-known work, Memoirs of Montparnasse, when resurrected in 2007 under the New York Review of Books imprint. It had been out of print uh, in Canada for nearly a decade, and there still is no Canadian edition of this work. Busby also alerts us that by 1970, the year of, of the publication of Memoirs, Glasgow's poetry was out of print, and his pornography was, quote, largely unrecognized, unread, and unobtainable in his native land. Uh, memoirs achieved critical raves and entered the bestseller list in 1970, but it has, thanks to the New York Review of Books in Premature, literally gravitated into the American domain where there was greater room for the licentious or body tell-all than is the case here. Um, it may be Frank Davies' 1974 appraisal of Glasgow's works for the boudoir as for the parlor is prophetic of later neglect. Davy classes Glasgow's oeuvre as consisting of eccentric achievements or as throwbacks of the decadent styles of the English decadence, with Glasgow strewing lovely roses over corpses, so to speak, or providing Botticelli's Venus with a dominatrix, dominatrix, I can't say it, I gotta be a Manitoba judge in order to say this right. A dominatrix's uh, riding crown, I'm sure you all remember that story that was in the, in the news a couple of years ago, which is, that's what all judges in Manitoba, I'm sure, do in their off hours, in any event, uh, it's like women in their off hours, and men in their off hours, in a, in a sense. Davy sees Glasgow's presenting a backward-looking vision, one tinged with melancholy, where joy is only reached through ecstatic suffering. Nevertheless, in memoirs, the writing is superb. The prose is direct, witty, and filled with sparklingly vivid sketches. Davy ends his survey of Glasgow's works with a bibliography that lists unblushingly the three erotic writings that Davy was able to find or that Glasgow was willing to admit to having penned. Crucially, one of the pieces listed is Glasgow's essay, The Art of Pornography, from 1969, which exonerates the literary form as being not sick, but merely, he says, the deliberate attempt by all the resources of the written word to stimulate the sexual appetite. And perhaps the public taint of pornographers served to return Glasgow to unmerited obscurity in English Canada, where perversion means voting improperly. Introducing Glasgow's memoirs vaguely is taken by the name dropping, sometimes disguised by pseudonyms, in this prose that is as much a roman a clay as it is recollected reportage. Leo Stein, a tall, thin, slow-moving man dressed in black, and Gertrude Stein, a rhomboidal woman, she gave the impression of absolute irrefragability. It was impossible to conceive of her lying down. And Ernest Hemingway, a burly, moon-faced man dressed in baggy tweeds. Among the, <laughs> among the pseudonymous acquaintances of Glasgow are Man Ray, thinly disguised as Narwhal, and Peggy Guggenheim, named Sally Marr in the book. But Bagley is also liberal enough to note that young Buffy Glasgow's homoerotic proclivities did not reduce his enjoyment of bisexual hedonism. Quote, a procession of women pass through Buffy's, Graham Taylor's, and Bob McAllman's beds. Sometimes the women are shared. Also of interest to Bagley are the sumptuous menus of Parisian meals that Glasgow records, including an enormous meal of oysters, langoustines with mayonnaise, sweetbreads with green peas, a pineapple tart, and a magnum of champagne. Clearly, the memoirs relish piquantly sensuality as well as the pleasures, not of textuality per se, but of schmoozing with an A-list class of scribes and a B-movie cast of groupies, socialites, dilettantes, pornographers, and hangers-on. However, given Glasgow's lifelong devotion to erotica, to seldom second-guessing the delights of debauchery, he must pin risque passages. 
for each such scene portends the climax of an accidental or sought out joy. After all, Glasgow philosophizes, I am persuaded half of man's miseries result from insufficiency of leisure, gourmandise, and sexual gratification during the years from 17 to 20. This is what makes this is what makes so many people tyrannical. I'm thinking Stephen Harper now. Bitter, <laughs> bitter, foolish, grasping, and ill nature. Once they have come to years of discretion and understand they have wasted their irreplaceable years in the pursuit of education, security, reputation, or advancement. Glasgow's prescription is a more elaborate version of all work and no play makes Jack or Jill a doll boy or girl, or of much study is weariness of the flesh. In any event, memoirs arrive just as the now generation is giving way to the me generation, which will conduct its mating rituals in discos and singles bars while snorting cocaine from McDonald's coffee spoons. But Memoirs of Montparnasse is also published just as a fad for the 1920s reemerges thanks to the Hollywood films The Gambler, 1974, and The Great Gatsby, also 1974, thus reminding 1970s 30 somethings that they were not the first generation to experiment with illegal drugs, as was alcohol during Prohibition, and or illicit sexuality. But Memoirs of Montparnasse is also published just at the same moment as grim, icy, dour, Nationalist manifestos such as Margaret Atwood's Survival, 1972, and the 1970 reprint of George Grant's Lament for a Nation, The Defeat of Canadian Nationalism for 65, originally, wherein the former reads Canadian life as a, as a survivalist boot camp, and the latter condemns Canada as a colony of America. In both cases, there is an implicit Protestant urge to do the right thing, buck up and resist the seductions of the American empire and its popular culture that could displace our own. Glasgow's memoir is too cosmopolitan for the nationalists and too indulgent in luxury of food and sensation for those who want to rough it in the bush, eat grass, and clean their asses with leaves. In other words, <laughs> Glasgow's delight in fleshly pleasures could strike some as un-Canadian or at least unpatriotic. But Glasgow insists happiness was the rule of my existence, a thing to be grasped and enjoyed by right, and hunger and sensuality too. One can contrast Glasgow's prescription for happiness with the Mounties' motto, maintien le droit, uphold the law, or for that matter, with the constitutional mantra of peace, order, good government. It will indeed be a new regime in Canada when Mounties morph from seizing marijuana to smoking it. <laughs> Certainly, for Buffy, political correctness is sheer stupidity when there are bottoms to fondle and glasses are turning bottoms up. And he remembers on visit to uh, one particular uh, Paris bordello, the inmates all rose, ran forward, and fell before our table in a torrent of flesh, wriggling their haunches, shaking their breasts, chattering obscenities, and sticking out their tongues. On this occasion, Buffy chooses a jolly-looking little brunette with bobbed hair who was shaved in every strategic place and wore a rhinestone choker. His friend Graham selects a beautiful but modest-looking mulattress protruding a pair of superb pear-shaped breasts. Post-coitus, there is no regret, no remorse. To me, he says, this first experience of a French prostitute was a revelation. I had quite simply never enjoyed myself so much in my life. Recalling an ideal in Nice, Glasgow exults, oh, blinding sun-baked days. Oh, beautiful blue water. Will I ever enjoy you again? Lobsters broiled in butter. Portuguese oysters tender little octopuses and black sauce. The memory of Nice contrasts radically with the later boring fare of a Montreal hospital stay, which consists of corned beef hash and jello. <laughs> Tellingly, Glasgow's closing of the paragraph with the jello spooned up in Montreal contrasts awfully with the apostrophizing of his sunny Mediterranean beach holiday and that exquisite menu. We go from the sublime to the sorry. Though Memoirs was published in the time of English Canadian Youth Rebellion, it still entered a culture whose leaders were demanding a new Puritanism tied to nationalism and ecology and feminism. I'm reminded here of Atwood's first novel, Surfacing, which ends partly with the destruction of a pseudo pornographic film while the heroine goes to ground, becoming a feminist version of Grey Owl. So the window <laughs> of acceptability for memoirs in Canada was very narrow. Discussing one of his influences, namely Casanova, Glasgow writes, between the lines of his memoir, we see the pattern of the world's mistrust and rejection of him gradually developing with a certain implacable force. 
This sentence is practically a prophecy of Glasgow's own tenuous place within the Canadian canon. But he's not alone in experiencing the slipperiness of his canonical status or text, perhaps due to his bosom embrace of the heaving bosom and the bracing beating. Pierre Burton, 1920-2004, suffered a similar fate, at least insofar as his singular work of erotica is concerned, namely Masquerade, 15 variations on a theme of sexual fantasy from 1985. If you are surprised to learn that Burton, author of the best-selling children's book, The Secret World of Og, from 1961, uh, uh, is also the author of this, of this text, it's readily explicable. For Masquerade was published under the pseudonym Lisa Kroniuk, K-R-O-N-I-U-K, who was, claims back cover bio, an immigrant, a single parent to one daughter, Lara, and had published an earlier novel, quote, in Eastern Europe on the theme of sexual ambiguity. One clue to the pseudonymous authorship is that no bona fide writer of erotica would likely identify a child or children in the author's bio. <laughs> Presumably, uh, Burton and his publisher, McClellan and Stewart, decided on the pseudonym to protect his image as bow-tied chronicler of popular histories and, of course, juvenile literature. So Masquerade, this novel in 15 parts, follows Glasgow's use of a pseudonym, but also his sadomasochistic vibe. And so I just quote one, one section of, of, of uh, one of the stories. It is I, mistress, the Lars figure says, I have come for chastisement. She raises her whip. On your knees, worm, she says coldly, and do not dare to speak again until I give you leave. He grovels, the sweat pouring from his brow. He licks the toe of her polished boot. She raises her whip. His jacket, she notes, is splendidly tailored. He cannot see the single tear rolling down her cheek. And again, I'm thinking Manitoba, because uh, uh, this is, yeah. Anyway, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, but, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I was just thinking differently she could do with the name, Manitoba. Uh, but in any, in any event, uh, unfortunately for Burton and publisher, the novel met with a tepid response. Uh, so on July 14, 1985, some newspapers carried this item. Now it can be told. The author of Masquerade, a steamy book about erotic fantasies, is not Lisa Kronia. It's Pierre Burton. Not only that, he started collecting his old age pension last week. At a party at a Toronto hotel, a panel of three, including Burton, was confronted with three masked women and asked to identify the author of Masquerade. Burton then revealed the secret, which he said he had kept eaten from his wife, Janet. Burton, who was 65 on Friday, is a popular chronicler of Canadian history. Masquerade is his first work of fiction, and he said he worked on it sporadically for several years. Bearing in mind that Masquerade is admittedly hardly good fiction, it may merit its near disappearance from Burton's oeuvre. However, as a blue text by a gold-fingered Canuck scribe, it might help us to read his acknowledged text as disguised exercises in sadomasochism. If so, Burton's titles like The Last Spike, <laughs> the Great Railway, 1881-1885, and 1972 would achieve a whole new dimension uh, if we keep in mind that he does have, or he did have this particular interest as well. One oddity of Burton's Lisa Kroniak pseudonym is the deliberate gesture to Eastern Europe, as opposed to, say, France or Britain, both of which have long traditions of erotica, as the originating site of the dirty-minded author. One can only speculate about Burton's acquaintance with Glasgow, though both received Governor General's awards in 1972 and are photographed together on the occasion. A connection could exist in terms of influence or intertextuality, however, between Burton and the, and the most successful Canadian English language author of erotic fiction, namely Hungarian-born Stephen uh, and a novel in praise of older women, the amorous recollections of Andras Zajda. Uh, and, of course, some images to go along with, with that work. Uh, so various editions, and, of course, uh, the VCR relates to the uh, Canadian film version of The Praise of Old Ruben from 1978. So there it is. Uh, again, uh, very successful work. As of the 1977 total paperback edition, the Canadian novel had sold over 2 million copies worldwide. That's as of 1977. A figure further boosted, no doubt, by the steamy film version of 1978. Burton's... Fifteen chapters also seem to follow the 16-chapter formula of Vizinci, who was born in 1933. No matter, Vizinci's novel purports to be the memoir of a Hungarian-born refugee who has landed at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon as a professor of philosophy. 
As such, each chapter of his amorous recollections opens with an epigraph taken from a well-known writer such as Benjamin Franklin or Jean-Paul Sartre or Friedrich Engels. One is placed then in the company of a learned European man, bourgeois by education if not by income, and urbane in manner if not by breeding. In addition, each chapter opens with a title initiated by the preposition on, so that this novel of lust and craving seems at first glance as sedate as any work of philosophy not pinned by the Marquis de Sade. In other words, Vizinci armors his work against connect knee-jerk reaction by giving it the trappings of an academic text. His fig leaf is ivy and his, and his exculpatory pose is that of a pedant. If there is a connection between Vizinci's fiction and Glasgow's memoir, it begins with the truth that the amorous goings-on are situated firmly overseas among the fallen Catholics and free and free-thinking Jews of France and Italy and Hungary. Nevertheless, the pornographer Glasgow is never as explicit as his Vizinci's Vajda. Quote, when I entered her, her body contracted as if she had been broken in two. Quote, again, I was obsessed with her stubborn vagina, that pine smelling fountainhead of our predicament. Quote, again, I raised Anne to her feet and she pulled me against her, placing my two hands firmly on her buttocks. I could feel them move through her flimsy summer skirt and I couldn't resist. Even so, Vizinci's protagonist foresees Glasgow's own pronouncements on life. Most moralizing about sex had absolutely no roots in reality. A moment of lovemaking produces the hero's cry, that was the way to die. I often thought during the night, my heart beating happily in my skull. When Vajta comes to Canada, he finds it a Puritan world. And he soon quotes an Austrian immigrant who says, Canadians love money first, then comes liquor, then TV, then food. Sex is way down on this. <laughs> and he goes on to say this Austrian fellow, when you grab a girl, a Canadian grabs another drink. The place is full, he's talking about Toronto exact, uh, to be precise, the place is full of fat men and unhappy women. And all of a sudden I have Rob Ford in my mind. But anyway, <laughs> as is true of Glasgow, so it is true of Vizinci's Vajda. One is always aware that he is professorial and intellectual, if less reserved about wanting sex than is the case for most English Canadian men. Reading of Vajda's Adventures, it is impossible not to, be, not to be reminded of Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, which shrouds the erotic and linguistic puzzles and puns French and Medicalese. In praise of older women seems, in part, a repost to Humbert Humbert's adoration of the nymphette, Lolita, while yet canvassing the identical old world versus new world contrast and the differences between intellectuals in love or at sex and those of less well-read lovers. Although Vizinci's intellectualized eroticism should have ensured a secure place for in praise of older women in the English-Canadian canon, its publication history hints at its troubled reception here. Originally self-published in 1965, it was reissued in 2010 as a Penguin Modern Classic, which is a bit of a coup. However, 45 years after its publication, first publication again, I'm talking about 2010, the protagonist Vashta is no longer situated at the University of Saskatchewan. Now, he's at the University of Michigan. A University of Chicago Press edition says the latest 1999 printing is the 44th printing of the English language edition. It is the fourth printing of the University of Chicago Press edition. Translations of the novel, we're told, went through over 100 printings. In 2001, the novel was translated for the first time into French and became a bestseller, number one bestseller in France. It appears to be in print in America and Europe, but not in Canada. And that may be suitable given that our hero Vajda finds Toronto a great disappointment and Vizinci's uh, American publishers believe Ann Arbor, Michigan, a fitting exile for a philosophizing Don Juan as opposed to socialist Saskatchewan. Yet, the intellectual pitch of Vizinci's work is more in tune with the European inheritance of English Canada than it is with the body exuberance of American erotica, which tends to view sex as a branch of comedy, not philosophy. In a 1977 postscript to the Totem Canadian edition, Vizinci muses, the frequently hostile and even hysterical reaction to erotic realism shows that it touches us where it hurts. Vizinci vows, many people who pursue sexual experience are embarrassed to read about it, that is, cannot bear to think about what it reveals about themselves. Perhaps this is the crux of the matter for English Canadians who may choose to brand as erotic the penetration of a Tim Hortons donut by the handle of a hockey stick. <laughs> to move from the blue to the noir, let us take out the true crime text, Invisible Darkness, by Stephen Williams, 1996. And here, 
Uh, Scott McCracken's uh, insights into detective uh, fiction should influence our consideration of true crime narratives. I'm going to skip over that in, in, terms, in terms of time and just uh, talk about the book. So, Williams' Invisible Darkness, A Strange Case of Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka, is, as its subtitle indicates, interested in the perpetrators of the rape and murder of three Ontario female adolescents, including Carla Homoka's own sister, Tammy Lynn, between 1990 and 1992. And I'll give you those... Uh, uh, two versions of the book uh, cover. Um, Williams is somewhat less interested in the victims and their official avengers, the police and prosecutors, except to indicate where the detectives were deficient and courts mocked by soft-titted psychiatry and adultish attorney. In his focus, Williams follows the predilections described by John Fraser, who, in reflecting on the murderers and, mur and murder victims chronicle in Truman Capote's true crime classic in Cold Blood, comments when one reads the reviews and looks at the photographs accompanying some of them, it was the murdered family that seemed remote and slightly unreal. The two killers, in contrast, emerged from the pages as interestingly disturbed nihilistic beings of a kind closer to intellectuals and more intellectually acceptable than the sort of Kansas farmer who goes willingly to church socials. Williams does accent the morbid biographies of his subjects, for they seem, in Fraser's words, interestingly disturbed nihilistic beings. And we get to peek at their bookshelves and glimpse their preferred movies. Williams is self-conscious about the literary credentials of his own nonfiction, opening the book with an epigraph from Baudelaire and exploring intensively, as had Capote, the psychologies of his protagonists, Bernardo and Homoka. Williams also documents, as Kirk Macon says in his introduction, a police investigation that yo-yoed dramatically from superhuman effort to unforgivable stupidity. On his website's homepage, Williams tells us that he began his writing career as a poet and studied literature under the tutelage of Northrop Fry, Irving Layton, and Marshall McLuhan. As a publisher, Williams has also rubbed, so rubbed shoulders with Leonard Cohen, Alden Nolan, and Robert Crutch. Uh, Williams' narrative of the suburban psychopaths, the Ken and Barbie doll exemplars of white bread, good looks, and middle class criminality, that is to say, tax dodging and cigarette smuggling, is sharply pinned, rigorously researched. It's not, of course, a whodunit, but more an examination of why they did it and how they got caught and how one perpetrator got off lightly. In this latter aspect, Invisible Darkness is a jacuzzi, graphing mercilessly the crackpot psychiatry, bumbling police, and lackadaisical lawyering that handed Carla Homoka a sentence of manslaughter rather than the identical life sentence for homicide given her husband, though evidence suggests that she was equally to blame for the couple's torture, rape, and murder spree. So race your shame is Williams' account of the crimes committed and the errors of police procedure and, prosecutor and prosecutorial ineptitude that both he and his wife suffered the indignity of police raids. Because police believed that Williams could not have written some passages in Invisible Darkness, Without having, excuse me, without having viewed videotapes that had been sealed by court order, he was charged with two counts of disobeying Sid Barr and faced a prison term of up to four years. Instead, he was acquitted from the charges in November 2000. The comprehensive detail of this true crime account, as well as the incisive reasoning and lyrical style, might be one reason for its great success. With at least 35 printings, Invisible Darkness is an international bestseller. Yet. The work does not appear to have gravitated to can-lit syllabi, which may have much to do with the Canadian reluctance to acknowledge murder as a viable subject for discussion. Despite histories of social violence, these moments where an individual or a small band of like outcasts strikes against the commonweal, thus instituting an instant of private or domestic terror seen to Canadians so ugly as to be necessarily suppressed. And uh, uh, Frank Davey, uh, his book on uh, Carla Homoka and, and the murders, uh, uh, goes to uh, great lengths to establish uh, uh, his opinion that, that, yeah, murder is not something that Canadians like to think about, unless, of course, we can connect it to the United States. So I'm going to jump ahead and leave aside all of his great quotations, and they are great, uh, but again, I'll, I'll continue to speed along here. So another noir true crime case is Chameleon. Uh, 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 the Lies of Dorothy Proctor from Street Criminal to International Special Agent from 1994, co-authored by Proctor and Fred Rosen. And now here is the image of this particular book. This text is a memoir of an African-Nova African Scotian woman who became a sex worker, a convict, a prison house madam, a drug trade facilitator, and eventually an undercover agent uh, for the OPP and the RCMP. Along the way, her special skin tone and physiognomy allowed her to assume various identities and ethnicities, including Chinese, Italian, Turkish, Sikh, Jamaican. 
The book shares affinities with memoirs of Montparnasse as being a partly unverifiable account of the lives that it chronicles. The author's note declares Chameleon to be the autobiography of Dorothy Proctor, but the next sentence fields a caveat. Everything is true to the best of Ms. Proctor's recollection. Moreover, although the title page presents the work as a co-authored text, the author's note aspires to an individual authority. Yet Proctor has told her story to Fred Rosen, a journalism professor at Hofstra University, who has merely typed, shaped, and presumably edited the raw manuscript. The author's note also admits or warns some of the conversations within the story have been reconstructed from interviews and research. The potential problems with documentation and veracity of Proctor's chameleon, along with the story arc, from the prison of poverty to non-metaphoric prison to eventual redemption of sorts, as an undercover informant for at least two police forces, suggests a nodding acquaintance at least with the autobiography of Malcolm X from 1965, another as told to memoir assembled by Exus amanuensis, namely Alex Haley. Famously, in his autobiography, the juvenile delinquent turned gangster turned Nation of Islam minister, adopting new identities, Malcolm Little, Detroit Rig, Minister Malcolm X as required, characterized his life as constituting a chronology of changes. Yet Proctor goes X one better. Her changes have actually been changes of identity. As plain Dorothy, she is a delinquent. As Dorothy Mills, she becomes age 17 in 1961, allegedly the first female escapee from the Kingston, Ontario prison for women. As a Montreal teen, she is little gangster. In Vancouver, BC, with the Chinatown triad, she is Ma Mei Wan. Later, she darkens her skin and wears dreadlocks to pose as Jamaican. As Chicky, she spends time with the New York Mafia and survives a hit executed while she is in flagrant delicto. It is one of the most graphically disgusting moments in an explicitly sordid tale. And I'm going to quote it right now for you. Lying on the bed, we began making love. Vito was very excited. When he could contain himself no longer, he mounted me, all the while stroking my ego with sweet pillow talk. Suddenly, the French doors burst open. No time to get him off me. I tried to look over Vito's shoulder, but he had me pinned to the bed while his hot fluid pumped into me. It was a low, quiet sound, and Vito stopped pumping. I felt grit and wet stuff on the side of my face and upper body. I brought my hand up to wipe some away. Then I saw it. The grit was skull fragments and the wet stuff brains and blood. The next sentence after this is either poetic license or unapologetic overkill. My scream was drowned out in Caruso's crescendo because the opera singer's record is playing at the same time. This is going on. If prison breaks, undercover cop work, and surviving a hitman's bullet while fucking a hoodlum seems a bit, well, un-Canadian. Uh, Proctor's explanation is that her childhood home in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, was a whorehouse. That confession is on page one. By page four, we read, I grew up thinking a penis was a teat, and we hear about a drunk who masturbating climaxed on my head. As semen dripped down my face, my mother licked it off. Her next memory, my mother holding my vagina open, her customers rubbing her penis against me for excitement and later inserting themselves into my mother. As she writes, no need to go on. One might want to skip over this text as so much deliberate wallowing in the gutter and stewing in the penitentiary, but it has many literary touches, including that operatic climax and sexual climax in the hitman scene. Moreover, on the Wikipedia page dedicated to her biography, Proctor describes prison psychology experiments carried out on she and other women inmates uh, employing electroshock therapy, sensory deprivation, and LSD prescription as being akin, she says, to Dante's Inferno. Although Chameleon omits these episodes, Proctor did sue Correctional Services Canada for $5 million in damages in relation to the alleged prison abuse just a year after this book's release. The suit was settled out of court in 2002. It's impossible to tell whether the book sold well. However, issued in the United States, it could not have had much circulation in Canada. Yet it rewards reading as a hard-boiled text, resolutely noir, meeting the definition that Skaggs provides. This school features a style derived from the tough guy prose associated with Ernest Hemingway and which was developed in the pulp fiction of the 1920s and 1930s in America. It is terse, tough, and cynical, and the typical narrative involves sex, violence, and betrayal. Yet Proctor's work also involves elements of police procedural, a crime text that emphasizes the actual methods and procedures of police work in the investigation of crime. It's an oral-based text, 
So it also conveys the color and timbre of Malcolm X's confessions of his gangland days, or for that matter, the jazzy underworld patter of Robert Beck and his African-American classic pseudo-memoir, Pimp, a recollection of his life in the game issued under his pseudonym, Iceberg Slim. That proper gives us a hard-boiled memoir, likely inflected by the give-no-quarter sagas of Detroit Red and Iceberg Slim, marks it as an un-Canadian text by woman. Strange and Lou recognize that in Canadian noir, the usual position of a woman is either victim or vixen. Though she was, as a girl and teen, a victim of sexual assault and racist marginalization, Proctor becomes, in the end, a victor by surviving, first of all, and secondly, by exercising both street marts and the exceptional resourcefulness born of a first-rate intellect to go from being a convict to being an undercover agent for the police. Yet, Chameleon is a zebra text. Its sex scenes strike with blue and the bloody scenes strike with noir. And so that is perhaps why it is not red all over Canada. Two, because it is an as-told-to first-person dictated account of a difficult-to-verify life of a black, blue-collar woman, not ostensibly a blue stocking, it may seem trashy, unworthy of ivory tower inspection. Yet, as I've noted above, Chameleon is informed by literature, especially from the African-American canon. Moreover, it is an odyssey of crime with the heroine moving through as many phases of identity as she does hits of heroin. Furthermore, for, furthermore, we might note that any oral-based text, such as Pierre Elliott Trudeau's memoirs, moves immediately into a pulp context, for it emphasizes the vicarious pleasure of eavesdropping on a supposedly true confession monologue. A uh, couple more images uh, to go with this, of course, an uh, early edition of autobiography of Malcolm X, and, uh, of course, Iceberg Slim's uh, 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 slightly fictionalized autobiography, uh, Pimp the Story of My Life. Uh, huge, huge, huge influence in African America. And of course, I, I follow up deliberately with, with memoirs uh, and, and Trudeau because he's also a bit of a chameleon in this text, uh, uh, adopting many identities. And I think it could be useful to uh, read uh, Dorothy Proctor alongside uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau uh, in terms of, of uh, the various guises and, and masks that one puts on in the tradition of a true confession monologue. Marion Engel's uh, sixth novel also offers, as does Proctor's memoir, Chameleon, a woman's titular identification with an animal, namely bear. Uh, and of course, uh, right, here we are, uh, to uh, cover images of, of this book. And I'm getting to the, towards the end here. One might consider both books as being implicitly shamanistic with the heroine's identity explicated and reinforced by her metaphoric relationship with an animal. In discussing Engel's uh, first uh, few novels in 1974, uh, Day, uh, uh, Frank Davy wonders uh, what formula Engel uh, will hit upon to help her solve the postmodern problem of finding meaning within chaos so that she can avoid writing further novels featuring female protagonists whose lives are all about obsessive desolation. With Beer, Engel's self-described very strange and rather obscene book, the, uh, the novelist adopts a classical Ovidian solution of implied metamorphosis. In this work, a librarian who has lived like a mole in the basement of an archive full of trivia and detritus is sent to investigate a bequest of books at a residence on Cary Island, north of Sault Ste. Marie. There she encounters an old male bear, which is both a pet of the property to be treated like a dog, and a resident in an old log house behind the house where the librarian will live while pursuing her cataloging. The protagonist, Lou, revels in the Cary Island home's faceted white bulk and broad and shining windows, the landscape and seascape hectic with spring's new green, and in essence, her ascension from musty, dim basement to the island household sea of gold and green light. Soon, in having the bear join her in her daily uh, uh, saunters to the water and then indoors, enjoying the warmth of the fireplace while she enjoys a whiskey, Lou, or more accurately, Engel, assaults what Lou terms the Canadian genteel tradition wherein any acts other than working and praying are erased from historical consciousness. Of course, pulp texts are in and of themselves assaults on gentility, and bear shortly bears its fangs against middle class pretensions. Once the woods had lost the first innocence of spring and inconsolably lonely, Lou regrets her weekly uh, coitus with her boss on her basement desk. She moves quickly from self freaking before the fireplace to letting the bear lick her nipples stiff and scour her navel, and then using its muscular and eely tongue, find all her secret places until she climaxes. 
Lou's solution for her lackluster love life and her more or less feminist displeasure with men is bestiality. But it is also Engel's blue solution for her own privacy stymied notions of liberating bitch goddesses. In any event, after deciding that instead of feeling evil, she feels loved, Lou opens her legs to her fishy friend, as the bearers describe, again. His tongue bent vertically and he put up her cunt. She cried out with joy. And at the same moment as the second coupling, a note falls from the book that Lou has been consulting. It reads, the offspring of a woman and a bear is a hero with the strength of a bear and the cleverness of a man. Old Finnish legend. Lou's sexual ideal with the, with the anonymous bear is complicated for her by the unsought but definite uh, attentions of the classically Christ Christian named local outfitter Homer, who is as ignorant about her thing for and fling with the bear as she is knowing about Homer, my man, and his one way open marriage. Their near adultery leaves Lou dreading men, not their eroticism, but their assumption that women had none, and craving further intimacy with her beast. Bear, I cannot command you to love me, but I think you love me. She cradled his big asymmetrical balls in her hand. She played with them as he licked. Thus, Lou shifts from being a desk, uh, a love-making mole to being a bear-licked outdoors woman. Importantly, she asks the bear, give me your skin, which is a plea for shamanistic union. But I also remember the 1975 African-American slang, give me some skin, which meant slap hands. Anyway, so anyway, and this is 1976, so you never know. Anyway. Uh, Give me your skin, which is a plea for shamanistic union. The bear to woman cunnilingus continues even to the extent that Lou slathers herself with honey to encourage the bear to go on eating her, even after its or his natural desire to do so had been satiated. Now she lives intensely and entirely for the bear. The pair kiss. She tries to make the animal penetrate her, but actual coitus fails bloodily. Slowly, majestically, his great cock was rising. It was not like a man's tulip shaped. It was red, pointed, and impressive. She took her sweater off and went down on all fours in front of him in the animal posture. He reached out one great paw and ripped the skin on her back. With that failure, Lou awakes to the sin of bestiality, realizes that she has become a kind of hermit, wild woman, cleans herself up and puts on lipstick, and then goes to Homer to share whiskey and make love. Filled with fresh despair, she attempts coitus again with the bear, but the animal rakes her back with his or its claws and she interprets the wound and resulting illness as again punishment for her acts of bestiality. Even so, she is changed. She is leaner, more nature inclined. She has found herself even while she has lost, must lose her bare lover who is shipped off to an elderly dying native woman. In her afterward to the 2009 edition of Bear, Aretha Van Hurt notes the novel has been called an outrage, pornography, as well as pastoral mythological gothic. She insists, even prudish readers must admit that a literal reading of Bear is tremendously exciting. Certainly, <laughs> well, you have to be there in the, <laughs> in, in, the, in the moment. And certainly, Engel takes up the classical tales of gods in the form of beasts and pregnating women. And of course, we think of Leda and the Swan, or Beauty and the Beast. And, but she reverses the gender agency, letting Lou take the lead with a beast that she often does lead about on a chain. There is also the Canadian genteel tradition of erudition at play in the novel, for as Van Hurt recognizes, Lou returns to her animal self, not only through her amour with the bear, but through a highly refined collection of books epitomizing the rational 19th century. However, Van Hurt misses the real import of Lou's seemingly offhand reference to Sir Charles Goddamn Roberts, a Canadian author with whom Lou is familiar. That is to say, Engel's primary intertext is not fables, myths, and legends of yore, but Charles G. D. Roberts' novel, The Heart of the Ancient Wood, published in 1900, which plums the meaning of the friendship between a girl and, says Joseph Gold, a great black bear, a bear that she brings home and feeds honey at the table like some great uncivilized Winnie the Pooh. In fact, this novel, and again I'm quoting Joseph Gold, tells the romantic tale of a young fatherless girl growing up in the wilderness and discovering her own womanhood and humanity, and it weaves into this an allegory of the relations between the sexes. As Van Herc assures us that Engel's novel is quintessentially Canadian as snow, so does Joseph Gold suggest in relation to Robert's precursor text, it could hardly be more Canadian. Gold elaborates that the female protagonist of Robert's novel, uh, Miranda, is only partially human. Her bear companion becomes a kind of second mother to her, initiating her into all the wilderness ways and is in turn partly domesticated, even taking some of her meals in the house, becoming in fact partly human as Miranda becomes partly wild. 
Well, Van Hurt presents a lopsided uh, triangle among Lou, the bear, and Homer with the human male, uh, quite dissatisfying comparison with the male bear. Uh, Roberts presents a triangle in which Miranda feels torn between her wild allegiances and her human and sexual needs and compulsions. Again, according to Go. Roberts' resolution is to bring human male and female together up to and including the killing of the bear. Engels' resolution is to bring male bear and human female into unconsummated coitus. Roberts writes a modernist fable. Engel drafts a postmodern blue fable, which may owe something to 1970s blue movies in which animal costumed humans have sex with maidens. Uh, in any event, Bear was a McClellan and Stewart success story. It has been translated into Swedish, Italian, French, both in Quebec and in, and in France, uh, German, and published in English in New York, Boston, London, as well as in Toronto. It has enjoyed some semi-success as pulp fiction in Canada, though perhaps this is due to its interest as a feminist fable as well as to its novelty as an erotic tale of animal and human contact. But it is couched utterly in a literary setting, a library, as well as in the outdoors, thus conjoining two Canadian delights, erudition and survival, but with a playful sexual context. And now I'm going to end. Uh, and I'm sorry for, for going on so long, but here are a couple of, well, there's the Heart of the Ancient Wood. Uh, uh, I think that's a later edition. And I'm not going to talk about Glitter and Chaos, Lisa de Nicolitz. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, truly is a popular uh, novel and so on. But maybe I can, I can say something about it in the, in the questions. So my conclusions are, it's only by exploring the supposedly lowbrow world of pop writings and pop culture that we can achieve a finer, more comprehensive, less elitist view of Canadian culture generally. I think it's useful to know that Pierre Burton, perhaps envious of Vizimchi's success with erotic fiction, tried to emulate it by producing a pseudonymous volume of sadomasochistic incidents. And again, it could be fascinating to reread his popular histories for the same, if repressed, sadomasochistic theme. Of course, Memoirs of Montparnasse is a repudiation of the stiff, stiff upper lip puritanical Anglophone Canada of the 1920s, and it could be read fruitfully in tandem with Mavis Gallant's short stories themselves set often in Paris and less frequently in a pre-quiet revolution, Montreal. Also interesting in these works is the emphasis on masquerade. So Pierre Burton pretends to be Lisa Kroniak. Glasgow uses pseudonyms and pretends to be anonymous. Dorothy Proctor is a physical chameleon of identities. It should help us read other Canadian portraiture, such as that of Yusuf Karsh, as not capturing essences but merely masks. Indeed, Engels Lou puts on a bear skin literally as she takes a beer for her lover, but this is merely the eroticization of Pierre Trudeau's buckskins as on the cover of No Mars. Um, uh, also, the, uh, uh, similarly, the As Told To book, whether chameleon or memoir, seems more direct, less intellectually pitched than standard memoirs, but in their aspiration to reach the mass will be, in varying degrees, lurid. No memoir can be read as a guide to the saintly life. So what is Canadian about pulp texts? The desire to attach an intellectual veneer to the most scrofulous and or disgusting subjects from bestiality to producing pornography. However, at the same time, this is true, such desires reveal that English-Canadian depravity is not a matter of getting into the gutter, but of raising the gutter to the level of the ivory tower. Yeah. <laughs>